going to have live questions, but we'll also have chat questions, written questions on the chat. Uh, I click on the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. I think you'll find it. And, um, but also perhaps we can take live questions. It'll depend how we go uh, for time. So what do you think? Shall we, people, shall we begin? Well, it's my enormous pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Trevor McDougall, to, be, to give this public lecture this evening. And uh, Trevor is, well, I'm, I'm proud to say he's my colleague and friend at the University of New South Wales. We, we acquired him from CSIRO when they were foolish enough to let him go. Uh, fella, he's a, he is a man of enormous distinction. Um, I could read part of it, except that it's too small and my light is not good enough. But I mean, what I know is that, well, in terms of national honours, he's a companion of the Order of Australia. That's Australia's highest civilian honour. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales and of Tasmania, and also a fellow of the Royal Society of London, the original true Royal Society, you might say. Uh, and he is, I, I, have a, I have a list of, of his present honours and so on that is just extraordinary. And it, it, it's too small, there are too many entries for me to read and too small for me to read. But he is, in relation to tonight's talk, he is president of IAPSO, the International Association for the Physical Sciences of the Oceans, which could hardly be more relevant, would it? I, I was particularly impressed that he was, well, I'm not sure that I can read this, but for the Academy of Science, the Academy of Science set up, set, set up a steering committee, set up a panel to look at climate change and its, and it, its importance. And uh, so I, I have seen too many things here, but let's just, just tell you. So I've lost it, but, it, but Trevor was the chosen chairman of this and of the report and uh, it, a report issued by the Academy of Science. So that's at least one of the best word that you can have around on the climate side. Yeah, I think so. About two years ago, we've got somebody who does not have a, <laughs> a uh, they're, uh, they're not uh, muted. So please mute if you are not muted, <laughs> and if, unless you want to say something. So, Anyhow, Trevor is a person of enormous distinction and is also a fabulous colleague and we are so delighted to have him and tonight I'm delighted that he's agreed to join his, uh, his computational mathematics community. He does have interests there, which I think he will touch on in his talk, but he's going to talk about, now I don't have it in front of me anymore, but it's, he's going to talk about the mathematics of physical oceanography and I've missed a few words, but, we, but nevertheless, with that uh, introduction, perhaps I can invite, oh no, let me just say first to people who have just joined, you can put questions on the chat, uh, chat um, icon at the bottom of your screen, written questions, and with luck, we may also be able to take live questions at the end, in which case you will unmute yourself at the end and, and try to attract my attention. So Trevor, it is my great pleasure to ask you to deliver the public lecture this evening. Thank you. But there's no time left, Ian. You've taken all the time talking about me. <laughs> well, I could have talked for longer. <laughs> um, so I could have read. I could have talked for longer. <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I now need to share my screen. Can you share your screen? Does it work? Ah, here we go. Some mathematical aspects of physical, ocean, physical oceanography. Thank you, Trevor. Okay. So is, is that looking good? Yes, fine, thank right. you. So my first slide, um, first of all, yes, thank you very much for inviting me and the opportunity of addressing this audience. Um, and uh, my first slide is this. It's uh, a picture of the ice on top of North America <clears throat> 18,000 years ago. 
Trevor, just before you continue, we're seeing the speaker's screen, not the uh, full screen slide. Okay, thank you, Ed. <laughs> I wonder how I can fix Swap, if you use swap displays up the top there. Yeah, the swap displays button, just to the left. That's the one, yep. Got there you. you. Yeah. Perfect. Ah. Right, so there we are with um, 18,000 years ago before the present at the uh, last glacial maximum, the last time it was cold. And there's uh, one kilometre of ice sitting on top of where Trump Tower is today. And of course, on, we're on top of where the White House is today. And of course, on top of most of Canada. So I want to put today's uh, talk in this context of 18,000 years and uh, such a large number of metres, one or two kilometres of ice, at a time when the sea level was about 125 metres uh, below today's level. So here we have uh, a, a picture of the uh, concentration of CO2 and temperature and sea level going back from today to uh, 400,000 years ago. So to put that in context, uh, we as a human race, Homo sapiens evolved around this time, about 300,000 years ago. And even at the last warm period here, which is 125,000 years ago, all of we humans were huddled in Africa. Uh, and about 50 million, 50, sorry, 50,000 years ago, our Aborigines started to, uh, they were inhabiting this uh, continent of Australia. And civilization happened in this warm period here in the last uh, thousands of years here. And not shown here is a blip of temperature and a blip of carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, the question is what's, what's been causing these variations in the last, uh, in these ice ages? And the answer is um, something called the Blankovich cycles. It's due to the fact that the earth receives different amounts of sunshine on periods ranging from 23,000 years to 40,000 years and beating at this 100,000 year period between these ice ages. And so there's a little, a little amount of heating that comes from that uh, variation of the sun's rays on the earth. And uh, when the ocean and when, and that heating will, so if, it's, if it's warmer, it'll warm the ocean. The ocean, when it's warm, can hold less carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide comes out and comes into the atmosphere. So where it's warm here, the carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere because it's getting less in the ocean and vice versa. So the ice ages are caused by a small amount of uh, forcing from the sun, but uh, amplified by the carbon dioxide. So here we are. Um, in a, a, a zoomed in section just showing 18,000 years. This was where uh, the picture of the ice I showed here 18,000 years ago. And this period here called the Holocene is the warm period, about four degrees Celsius warmer than during the coldest part of the last glacial maximum. So some people find it very surprising that between an ice age period and this warm period we're in now is only four or five degrees Celsius globally averaged. Human civilization back from the pharaohs uh, starts here at a few thousand years before the present. Christianity as a, um, Christianity as a, can you see that, uh, that pointer? Yep. Good. Yes, you can. Christianity was invented around this time here, which is 2000 years before the present. And then along came, um, we humans, we got clever and we uh, decided that having, having, uh, take, having cut down most of the trees in Europe to fuel our lifestyle, we then discovered coal and started burning that and that temperature has increased uh, like this. And uh, the Paris um, Climate Change Conference tries to uh, have commitments from the countries to limit the warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees above pre-industrial, but um, if we keep on uh, emitting fossil fuels at the rate we are today, we'll be going well above that. And this is just the temperature towards the end of the century. 
Okay, so, so we should be entering an ice age now. We've had 18,000, 20,000 years of a warm period. But instead of that, we're actually, um, because we've um, increased the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we've, uh, we're melting uh, Antarctica. You can see the Antarctic uh, ice here is going up in the last 20 or so years. It's now uh, contributed about eight millimeters of sea level rise to the, to the globe uh, and accelerating. And in the Arctic, sea ice here was you know, 17,000 cubic kilometers. It's now down to four over a period of uh, just um, what's that, 30 years or so. And um, of course, this, this ice is sitting uh, on the ocean. So it, when it melts, it doesn't increase the sea level very much, but it does open uh, the, the, uh, the Arctic to, uh, to the atmosphere. So that's the past. What about the future? Well, this graph is to give you a feeling of uh, the relationship between carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere versus the emissions. So here, we are about here in 2020. We have choices to make as a society, as a population of developed world. We can keep on emitting uh, carbon dioxide like this, or we can uh, get serious about the problem and start decreasing our concentrations, uh, sorry, our emissions each year like this, um, such that by the end of the century, we're a fraction of our maximum emissions. Uh, but even, even with this draconian way of looking at, or you know, our responsible way of looking at um, the problem and reducing our emissions, our actual concentration just still keeps on going up. It's quite hard to turn this concentration curve around. And that's because the climate is not in equilibrium today. So what will we have to do to actually um, reduce uh, or make it a, a reasonable chance, a two thirds chance here of not exceeding a two degree warming from pre-industrial times? This graph was made 10 years ago. And it said, well, if we were really conscientious and we had our peak emissions per year here in 2011, then we could go on this curve and the maximum slope here, the maximum rate of reductions per year would just be 3.7%. If we were uh, quite uh, slow about it, we could have our peak emissions uh, in a future year called 2020. Uh, and then the price we'd pay for that to would is that later on, about this time here, we'd have to have very uh, sharp emission reductions, 9% per year. Well, of course, we've actually kept on emitting uh, faster than this, so the problem's worse. But you can see why climate scientists are telling the, the politicians that every decade counts. counts. This is a, a delay of just one decade in, in, in being serious about the problem and it's made our uh, technology transfer or technology improvements go from a required 4% per year to 9% per year. Another aspect on that problem is, okay, imagine, imagine we want to get down to what the Paris commitment of between you know, one and 2.3 degrees here uh, by the end of the century. Then this is the sort of emission uh, per year we'd have to achieve this green line. And you see that at some stage here, towards the end of the century, it, we have to have neg negative net emissions. That's because we've left the task of addressing this problem so late in the day that we can't just get away with having zero emissions. We actually have to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere in order to avoid a warmer temperature than this. <clears throat> so the problem is urgent. And as a species, as a race uh, of people on this planet, we have to decide very soon uh, whether we want to be rational and solve the problem in a way on the left here, or whether we're going to be stupid and actually uh, let the problem, the, the climate run away with itself. And if we keep on uh, opening new coal mines, this is where we'll end up. At this, this is uh, at the end of the century, we'll have uh, warming, um, globally average warming of say four degrees Celsius, but in parts, it'll be uh, much, much more than that. And you can see actually on this diagram that the ocean warms up less than the land, that's well known. Uh, and also the Southern hemisphere here warms up less than the Northern hemisphere. And that's all to do with the ocean. 
All right, so going back in deep time again, um, this is the 18,000 years ago plotted here where the temperature was like, well, this graph says six degrees less than today. Uh, and the sea level was 125 meters uh, less than today. Here's today. Um, and uh, back 40 million years ago, we had this period where the sea level was about 70 meters uh, higher than today. Most of the ice had melted. Uh, and the, it, was a, it was quite a lot warmer um, than today. And this is the one of the forecasts for the end of the century from the IPCC of where we're going with our greenhouse warming. And you, you've, you'll say, well, this is funny. You've got a warming here of some three or four degrees, but you've only got a sea level rise. Well, it doesn't look like anything. Well, it turns out there is a sea level rise there from today, and it's actually one metre or less, about 80 centimetres. And so you say, well, Trevor, why is that not up to this level here? Why isn't it like, like 25 uh, metres? That'll be someone wanting to sell me something. Um, and the reason why this isn't uh, much higher is simply because even within a century, the ocean still is not nowhere near coming into equilibrium with the atmosphere. The ocean's very large, very deep, a lot of mass, a lot of thermal mass, and it's uh, warming it all up takes a long, long time, much longer than a century, up to thousands of years. And so this, <clears throat> this uh, has a nice, interesting plot here is the last time the Earth had the current amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, today it's about 410, I think, um, parts per million, the sea level was in fact 25 metres high. So we do have 25 metres of sea level locked in if we maintain the current level of CO2. It will take a long time to get there, but get there it will. I thought I'd just show a, a modern data representation of the average temperature at the surface of the planet. A lot of the wiggles here are due to El Nino, distributing heat around the place from the surface to deeper in the ocean. Some's due to um, the uh, aerosol effect of uh, volcanoes, and some are due to longer term variations in the ocean, various modes uh, that we could talk about. All right, so I spoke about the ocean being a flywheel for heat, and uh, a lot of the heat content uh, uh, is in the ocean. So this is a, a, a schematic of the warming over some period. Let's concentrate on the um, the purple ones here, which is the warming over a, a 40 year period. This is the increased uh, heat content of planet Earth represented by this amount here of 16 uh, by 10 to the 22 joules. And that's composed of a little bit of melting of ice, a little bit of warming up the atmosphere, a little bit of warming up the solid Earth and the continents, a tiny bit of melting Antarctic ice, Greenland ice, a little bit of melting some glaciers, and mostly it's the warming of the ocean. So if you think of global warming and think of the heat coming into the planet, 92 or 93% of it is ending up as warming up the ocean. So there's a, a, a graph of the warming. Uh, this is the heat content, the, the total uh, heat that's in the ocean, and it's the variation with time. And you see it uh, increasing like this. Towards the end of my talk, I'll talk about a, a, a new method for vertically interpolating data. We believe that this graph, this data through here should be down around the axis here, simply because this data was formed by linearly interpolating sparse data in the vertical uh, and uh, uh, with a, a more robust interpolation technique, it shows that the uh, heat content has been, um, been overestimated in the past, which means that this the, the ocean and the planet has actually warmed quite a bit more than people think today. So how does sort of climate 101 starts with this picture where the, the sun warms the planet as a function of latitude in the equator. <coughs> and uh, the, uh, there's less sunshine coming in towards the poles. And then <coughs> the planet radiates uh, heat to outer space in the red curve, and there's a surplus in these latitudes and a deficit here. 
So why doesn't the equatorial region just get hotter and hotter and hotter with time and the, and the equators and the poleward regions get colder and colder and colder? And the reason is because of the fluid parts of the planet, the atmosphere and the ocean, they have the role of distributing this excess heat that is being accumulated in the uh, arriving in these lower latitudes and, and transporting it north in the, northern, in the uh, north and northern hemisphere and south and the southern hemisphere and making the poles less cold than they would otherwise be. And this is the uh, role of the atmosphere in doing that, the red line, uh, and the role of the ocean. So the ocean's an important player in transporting heat from the equatorial region towards the poles. And there's two basic ways that the ocean does this. One is by horizontal uh, circulation. So like the Gulf Stream here transports warm water to the north. And as it comes back, it's a little bit colder than it was going north. And the same with the East Australian current it's coming south here quite uh, and quite warm and a little bit colder as it comes uh, comes back on this uh, other side and so that's one way of uh, of how the ocean does its role in transporting heat towards the poles the other way in fact the the more important way is by a vertical overturning so this shows uh, in the southern uh, and near antarctica and in the north atlantic there are two spots where uh, deep, what's called deep water is formed, or, uh, and it's where it's cold, and also when ice is formed, it makes, it makes the water salty, and therefore it makes it dense and sinks. And the blue here is coming uh, like this, and at depth, and the red is the shallow circulation. I'll show some, a better picture of that shortly. Yeah, here. So this is uh, the Southern Ocean point of view. Here's Antarctica. And um, this dense water sinks all the way to the bottom of the ocean and then slowly comes up like this. Now, this schematic shows the oceans as little uh, slices like this and the continents are the spots you know, in between. So it's just very much a schematic. But the point is to show that this dense water slithers along the bottom and slowly rises up. But that, that circulation is what's uh, accounting for a good fraction of the ocean's role in climate. So here's a cross section uh, from um, the uh, southern uh, near from Antarctica to about the latitude of Hobart, but I think it's actually a cross section in the Atlantic um, of density. Uh, it's actually something called neutral density. Uh, which is denser at the bottom than the top. And that's the first thing you need to understand about the ocean and the atmosphere. It's always denser on the bottom and less dense on top. We call that stratified. And um, the, um, the really surprising thing about the ocean and these deeper layers is how little mixing there is. Uh, these layers are like this uh, alcoholic drink uh, of different densities here. Uh, and as, as given by the colors. And here you could put a spoon in this drink and mix it up pretty quickly, pretty easily. But here it's very, in the ocean, it's very hard, or there's very little mixing going on. Um, what mixing go there is going on is important, and in, I've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, but to show you how, how, how small the mixing is, this is an experiment done in the, uh, 300 meters, but it's even more true deeper down, where a tracer was put in at one depth and was put in just uh, at a, a thickness of say one meter, I think it was, plus or minus one meter. And then 12 months later, it was, it was measured and it spread out a total of plus, like plus and minus 30 meters in the vertical. But in that, in that one, in that 12 months, it actually uh, moved around the ocean uh, some three or four hundred uh, hundred thousand kilometers, like a good fraction of the ocean basin was was the movement and spreading horizontally. Uh, it would have spread two or three hundred kilometers horizontally, but only thirty meters in the vertical. So it's um, a very much a, a layered system with a very small amount uh, but important amount of vertical mixing going on. 
and this here is uh, the size of the vertical diffusivity in the interior of the ocean. So this is the picture we have. There's a lot of actual, a lot of processes here. Uh, when, when you're an oceanographer, you have to you know, contend with all these myriads of processes. Um, these, uh, these eddies here uh, are dynamically the same as the weather systems we see on our weather maps. On the weather maps, they are a thousand kilometers across in the ocean, they are uh, roughly 100 kilometers across, they're smaller. And, uh, but this, the layered nature of uh, the ocean is uh, what I want to talk about. And, um, and then we've got uh, something called mixing over rough topography, which we'll come back to later in the talk as well. So now I, I've done the introduction, if you like, I'm going to address uh, this cartoon saying, well, now I'm going to uh, tell you some of my own research in, in layman's language. And the answer is uh, K minus four, well, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so let me tell you a little story about the first bit of research I ever did as a PhD student, which was more than a year or two ago. Uh, it concerned what happens uh, when a undersea oil well blows out at the bottom of the ocean. And when you have that happening, uh, you have not only the oil, but also uh, gas coming out. And it's the gas that provides the buoyancy to drive a plume towards the surface. And um, the unique thing about this, well, first of all, a plume normally would uh, in trains fluid from the environment. And remember I said it's dense here and less dense on top. So it entrains enough fluid until at some stage it decides, gee, this plume is now the same density as the stuff around it, the ocean around it. If I go any further, I'll be heavy and I'll want to sink back. And that's what happens. But in, a, in this case of a bubble plume, the, uh, the oil will sink back and come out here, but the bubbles reform and start another one of these things. And so I'm indebted to um, Schlumberger and BP when they uh, made a few critical mistakes 10 years ago in the uh, Gulf of Mexico and had the deep water horizon blow out because um, now this work of mine from some years previously is getting a lot of uh, citations um, because in that blowout uh, only about a third of the oil in the deep water horizon blowout reached the surface the rest spread out uh, just like so so uh, sometimes you have to wait for a long time before uh, your research uh, gets the recognition it deserves um, now a bit more mathematical um, this is some work I did with Peter McIntosh at CSIRO. And um, remember I said that the, uh, the ocean has very small mixing across these layers, these density surfaces, uh, very small amount of mixing, but I've got two density surfaces here and in between I've shaded it. And what I've drawn is the height of the surface. So the height's going up here versus time. And, um, and you can think of this as being perhaps a month or two as an eddy goes past, and this could be a, hundred, a few hundred meters in the vertical. So we've got, it's waggling around, going up and down uh, like this. And what we would like to do is to actually represent the transport, uh, say to the velocity in the north or the east um, of this shaded fluid. It could be the heat we're worrying about, or it could be some tracer. Um, but we do want just to, to have the transport being represented properly in this system, which we know is very small mixing across these surfaces. And um, you can see that if the velocity is say going into the page here, the total transport would depend on the velocity as a function of time, but also the thickness. So that the, the heat that's going uh, northwards or into the page is the correlation between the velocity and the thickness. And that's the key because our, our ocean models uh, are usually have uh, their vertical coordinate being uh, height. And yet we want to represent in that model the transport of something that's wiggling up and down by hundreds of meters. Well, it turns out we cracked that problem. And um, one of the implications of this is that if you actually uh, more a current meter at a point in space and say, well, what's the average velocity going to the north and to the east 
it might be this velocity here. But if you start saying, well, what's the, tr what's the velocity at which heat or tracer goes, it'll be some other velocity. So this one's called the Illyrian velocity, this one's called the Lagrangian velocity, and the difference is what we worked on. And the answer uh, looks like this, that the, the models carry this, uh, this average velocity at constant uh, location called the Illyrian velocity. And what we want is the velocity at which stuff is transported. Um, and uh, to do that, we add on a three-dimensional velocity vector and a vertical component going in the direction K, a horizontal, two horizontal components that are given by this vector string function, and the horizontal divergence of the string function gives the vertical component. And we found that string function to be this, this expression when, met, when evaluated in height coordinates. So at constant height, the correlation of velocity and density corresponds to this correlation between velocity and thickness. Um, and so that's been remarkably uh, successful. All the ocean models have a parameterization for this, this uh, what we call quasi-Stokes string function in it. And it's a way of representing, uh, may, allowing these models that are represented in high coordinates to represent things happening which you can't resolve in this uh, density coordinate approach. All right, so back to this picture of the uh, density services, the question in now is what are these density services? How would we go about defining them? And it's a complicated uh, issue. So for many, most of the last century, we used this uh, potential density, which has the idea that you take a fluid parcel and you move it to a reference pressure, usually the sea surface, and you ask that what the density is up there and you use that. So all the points along this line here um, have, uh, this, have the property, they all have the same value of density. If we took them, we put a plastic insulating bag around each parcel and moved it to the surface, they've had the same value of that density. And there's several things that are, are, are undesirable about that. But this is what uh, the surface that we have proposed and is used now in the ocean community. It's called neutral density and its, it's, its thought process is like this. So we start with a very small motion in the, we're somewhere in the ocean. We say, what, what's the tangent plane? What's the flat surface that I could uh, move a parcel on uh, while um, that parcel wouldn't be uh, would be cap would be happy to stay on that plane without having a vertical force going up or down and um, that surface is the surface in which the gradient of temperature and the gradient of salinity are, are balanced so that so that the effect of temperature and warming uh, uh, in making the parcel less dense is the same as the effect of salt in making it denser. Um, and these, this thermal expansion coefficient here, alpha, and the corresponding contraction coefficient for salt, they are functions of, oops, they are functions of not only the salinity and the temperature, but also of the pressure. And therein lies the fly in the ointment because this expression is not a total uh, derivative, not a total derivative because it hasn't got a, uh, a chance, it hasn't got a gradient of pressure in there. It's just a, great, a linear combination of two gradients of temperature and salinity. And um, this gives rise to a lot of problems for us. Okay, so this is the three dimensional uh, normal to the, uh, to the the surface. So assuming this uh, surface exists, this is the normal vector pointing up here somewhere. And in order for that surface to exist, we need the fact that the helicity is zero. That is, you take the curl of that vector, that normal vector, and you dot it with the vector itself. This has to be zero. All right, so this is an expression for that. There's, there's the vector, the normal vector, there's dotted with its curl. And that could be simplified in these three ways here. So um, this is the gradient, the triple scatter product of a gradient of pressure, salinity and temperature. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, this is uh, 
this one here, for instance, is this is the vertical uh, unit vector. So it's just a, the cross product of two gradients, so salinity and temperature and constant pressure. All caused by this, this particular nonlinearity of the equation state, the fact that the thermal expansion coefficient varies with pressure, or equivalently, the fact that sound speed varies with temperature. Um, so that in words, that's what those three lines mean, but I'll describe them in a minute. Another um, mathematical result from this is that if, if um, this triple scalar product is zero, which is what's required for there to be a well-defined surface, you can show that that also means that not in physical space, which what these grads mean, but in this parameter space, salinity, temperature, pressure space, so let's think of that as a three-dimensional space where each of the axes is salinity, temperature, and pressure. Uh, if helicity is zero, then all the data from the whole ocean has to fit on a, a, a surface, a single surface, rather than filling a volume in this space. Um, so the first of those requirements says that this triple scatter product has to be zero. Well, this, is a, this green surface is a surface of constant temperature in three-dimensional space in the ocean, say at some thousand meters deep depth, say. This is a surface of constant salinity, and where they meet is a, a line of constant temperature and salinity. And what this says is that if such a surface, a neutral surface exists, the helicity has to be zero, which means this vector, oh, for goodness sake, this vector has to lie down parallel, it has to be, has to lie flat. It can't be can't be kicked up in the air like this with a gradient of pressure along. It has to be going at constant height, so to speak, through here. That's a very unlikely thing you'd think for the ocean to, to want to do. Why would it have the line of mix of, of where the temperature and salinity uh, surfaces meet uh, not, why would it be restricted to being just uh, having that flat? The other constraint was, or the equivalent constraint, is that if you form such a surface, the, the lines of constant temperature and the lines of constant pressure have to be coincident. They can't be as drawn, the gradient of one and the gradient of the other have an angle between them. So they have to have zero angle between these two gradients. That also seems unlikely. And the other one was that the gradient of salinity and temperature have to be parallel uh, when plotted at constant pressure. So here's a pressure of 1,010 decibars, about 1,000 meters deep. This goes from the south to the north through the equator up to the Mediterranean water in the south and north Atlantic. And you see that in fact, this tends to be a line. There's, there's no data in the middle. If you do this at various depths, you get what appears to be like a, a Toblerone packet of chocolate, but someone's come along and eaten the chocolate. There's nothing inside. It's just the wrapper that's left. So, um, so why is it that the ocean tends to have a small value of this helicity? And uh, we can illustrate that here. Um, so here's a particular density surface in the Atlantic, south to north. The Mediterranean water is always warm and salty. That's the red stuff here. Um, and this surface outcrops at zero pressure, goes deeper and comes up and outcrops again towards the north. And so you see that where there's a temperature gradient here, given by these gradients of color on the right, there's no pressure gradient. So this thing tends to be small. And where there's a pressure gradient up here, there's no, not much temperature gradient. And down here, where there's a pressure gradient and a temperature gradient, they're parallel. And so the ocean's somehow abhorring this uh, neutral helicity and trying to, trying to conspiring amongst itself to get rid of it and have a small helicity. And so we find if we plot pressure and temperature on the surface, there's not much volume. There's a bit of thickness here, uh, but uh, and there's a bit here, but not much in the rest of the ocean. So if you, I've been saying it's small, but it's not actually zero. This is a map of the helicity here. Um, and it, helicity comes in positive and negative amounts like this. Um, 
So, all right. So because of this non-zero helicity, that means that this surface is this surface I've driven in blue is only approximately neutral. Uh, and that means that it's possible to move and mix things along the surface and get a flow through like this, like this pigtail, um, without doing ordinary dipectal mixing, ordinary vertical mixing of that small number I showed you, but that achieves, that's, that's the main way we think of of getting flow going vertically across these surfaces. But here, this surprising way is another way, this helical motion. And if this were a big effect, it would make a lot of the work we do uh, redundant. We, we wouldn't need to study diapical mixing, tidal mixing, et cetera, because there'd be this strong process for getting flow transport to, transporting dense fluid from the bottom to the top of the ocean. And this is about as far as we've got with this problem, and they're still working on it with a student, uh, Aaron Lang. And um, this is a, a, a map of the flow through a well-defined surface. So this is about uh, our technology, about the, one of the best surfaces we could pick, the most neutral surfaces we could pick. And yet this red, in this red region, we have flow coming vertically upwards through the surface. And this blue region, flow coming vertically downwards through the surface at the rather large velocity of 10 to the minus seven meters per second. Now, that's, that doesn't sound a lot to you, uh, I'm sure, but three meters per year is a lot of uh, an uncomfortable amount of vertical velocity through these surfaces. Um, so, you know, a human lifespan, uh, a parcel moving uh, 300 um, meters here is, is a very large distance. And we don't know um, exactly how to uh, treat this problem or how to, how to rationalize it. We've, we're working on ways of decreasing the size of these errors, and we can reduce them by a factor of three or so, but we can't make them go away. And uh, we need to understand what the implications are for other oceanographic practices. All right, so a uh, new topic, um, simple question, what is heat in the ocean? If I give you a parcel of seawater, if I give you a cubic meter of seawater of a certain temperature and salinity at a certain pressure, I want you to ask you, what is the heat content of this parcel? Uh, it turns out we didn't have an answer until a few years ago. Um, so this is at the sea surface, uh, the heat capacity. We've known this, uh, this diagram for over a century. We've known that uh, when, the, when water is fresh, it has a higher heat capacity than when it's salty. In other words, if you want to warm up a kilogram of seawater here by one degree Celsius, you've got to supply 4,000 uh, joules of energy. But if you want to warm up this a kilogram of water that's fresh, then you've got to supply 4,200 joules of energy. And uh, until recently, we oceanographers, both observational and modeling, climate uh, modeling, we ignored this five or six percent variation in the heat capacity. Uh, but it turns out it's actually very simple to fix this problem. And um, the answer really was looking at us all the time, if we bothered to think about it. And it's the first law of thermodynamics. I've written this first law of thermodynamics in terms of potential temperature. So potential temperature is the temperature of a fluid parcel after you've moved it uh, to the reference pressure, which is due to the sea surface, you don't, you inquire what the temperature is up there, not down here. And it turns out that then the radiant heat and the uh, other heat flux across the sea surface and the dissipation of energy from stirring, like, like warming up your tea by stirring it vigorously. Um, these things are well known It's part of the first law it's the part over here which we've been ignoring. We've been saying this has been constant. And we've just shown that the heat capacity here varies by 6% at the sea surface. Well, the answer came to me one day as I was swimming before work. Um, what about if instead of asking what the temperature is, having made that adiabatic movement to the surface, 
uh, we asked instead what the enthalpy was up there. And enthalpy is like, you know, shorthand for, uh, it's geek language for heat content. Um, but, and the, and the key thing was to think about it after the movement to the sea surface. And the, the key thing is that when you do that, this heat capacity becomes a constant number. You still have this multiplying bracket here, which is, you know, the absolute temperature in Kelvin. So it's 273.15 plus the degrees centigrade in Celsius in, in, in situ and in potential. But this bracket here varies by only 1% of the variation of this. And so all of a sudden we've got a, a way of understanding the first law, the way of conserving heat in the ocean, which we didn't have before which is a factor of 100 times uh, more conservative. And it means that we carry this new temperature variable con so called conservative temperature rather than what we've been dealing with for all of uh, last century, which was potential temperature. And the difference can be up to 1.8 degrees Celsius at the uh, outflow of the Amazon, which is quite warm here. Um, it's uh, fortunately we've arranged it to be small, the difference to be small where the ocean is about this salinity and also where it's cold through here. Um, so that's, that's the kind of light bulb moment that you dream of as a scientist to have, you know, a, a thought comes to you. And in this case, before morning tea on that very same day, I knew it was going to be a winner. And eventually it became accepted into this uh, global standard for definition of seawater and in fact humid air and ice as well accepted by unesco the intergovernmental oceanographic commission recommended by oapso and score and i could bore you uh, for another few hours by talking about the other new thing we invented which is absolute salinity but i won't do that back to this um story about the dense water um, from Antarctica falling down and having to uh, rise up again to complete this loop and to contribute to the, um, the ocean's role in heat transfer. Um, we've known for uh, 30 years that um, the uh, ocean mixing is concentrated towards the bottom of the ocean. And this is in the, a famous experiment in the Brazil basin in the uh, 1990s. And the colors here are in fact, the amount of mixing in diffusivity units. And um, before that we had, we just thought mixing was uniformly distributed through the ocean. And um, so I asked myself the question, what are the dynamical implications of having the mixing all concentrated towards the bottom rather than being spread out through the ocean? And this is rather recent uh, research that still hasn't had its major uh, hasn't been um, completely absorbed by the community, I think. But the idea is this, in the olden days, um, we used to think that mixing um, had a constant diffusivity, which meant that uh, the mixing of buoyant, the fluxes of density and buoyancy were larger at height here and smaller at depth. And what that means is that, that a fluid parcel uh, has a bigger flux of uh, density here, smaller here, it gets lighter and uh, it starts rising. So the blue arrows here are the vertical velocity of fluid passes going through these density surfaces. That's how we used to think about it. It was a work that was made famous by Walter Monk in a paper in 1966. Geothermal heating would make the water uh, along the bottom uh, go a bit faster. But what we now, we now realize is that because the mixing is bottom intensified, these red arrows are bigger than the ones up here. And in fact, the fluid passes are all sinking through here. And so the only way, but we know that on average fluid has to rise up, which means that it has to come sneak along very fast along, these, uh, along the bottom, um, the very bottom of the ocean. And we are still understanding how that uh, works. And this is a model study, which is the old way of thinking where we had um, the mixing increasing with height. And with that, such a model, you could afford to have vertical walls and um, the total uh, uh, diapicnal transport in cubic meters per second, uh, this is a million cubic meters per second, these units, um, is mostly due to the blue interior uh, upwelling, vertical velocity upwards, 
and partially due to the stuff coming along the, the boundary. But in, in fact, what's happening is that, first of all, you, you, you have to realize that the mixing is uh, decreasing with height, not increasing. And that demands that you have to take into account the fact that the ocean um, is, uh, has this, uh, it hasn't got vertical walls, hasn't got flat bottoms, it's got sloping walls. And so the area at each height is quite variable as a function of height. And so you can see here, the blue is actually the, the areas where the fluid is sinking and the red is where it's rising. And it's rising in these sneaky little bottom boundary layers, such that here's the net, uh, the black is the net upwelling, still about 20 of these units. Um, but it's mostly happening in the boundary more than like double what's happening in the boundary and then sinking in the interior. So we've changed just by this simple uh, budget process a few years ago, we've changed what we think about the ocean in terms of where the upwelling is happening. In the bottom half of the ocean, we now believe that the uh, fluid is sinking, thousands of meters are sinking slowly towards the bottom and then quickly rising up in these sloping boundary layers. So right now there's um, like this, uh, sinking in the interior, uh, and rising fast uh, through here. And so right now there's an experiment uh, going out in the Rockwell Trough in the Northern Hemisphere. We're putting out, uh, they're putting out a tracer, purposely released tracer here at this, at say a point here, which we've modeled, R Ryan Holmes here has modeled it in Sydney. And we let it diffuse. And you find that after some time, it's, it's uh, the centroid of the tracer is up here. It's going upwards, that's what you expect. We're predicting this flow going upwards in the bottom boundary layer. And, um, uh, and if we put the tracer out somewhere else, out here will go downwards. And they're trying to um, verify this, this model of what's going on in the ocean. Um, okay, so uh, we've got some time here. I want to talk on t about two... Um, two uh, mathematical uh, techniques or tricks, papers I've come across in the last few years. In the, in the course of doing uh, this research in oceanography, we came across the need to uh, find a vertical interpolation method that worked better than things we had available. So here's, here's some real data from the ocean, these black data points, salinity and temperature. And um, the first thing we try is splines. Well, it turns out this is a blown up view of the salinity here at these data points. The spline just the spline tends to give us exaggerated um, curvy bits that we don't like. It looks quite unrealistic, and um, so we've uh, and the linear is these uh, purple straight lines between them. So oceanographers have decided that splines are unreliable, and in the absence of other things, uh, oftentimes the linear has been linear has been adopted but we didn't think that was quite good enough. So we kept working on this problem and we um, started to consider P-chips. Now this is a piecewise cubic home height interpolating polynomial. It has the feature that at each of these black points, the, um, the interpolating uh, data, the interpolated data is continuous, so that's good. The first derivative, that's the slope is continuous, but the curvature, the second derivative is discontinuous, whereas a spline, also has the curvature being continuous. So the spline here overcorrects this, um, this, these data points. This is a, a rough view of a delta function, of course, and the uh, spline overcorrects this in this way. We don't like that. And the P-chip um, on this right-hand picture has the bad feature that if you have two data points that are similar uh, at an extremum, then it, the P-chip has to go between them with no, no, uh, no ability to be able to form a smooth curve through them. So we didn't like that. So what we dreamt up is this method, which is, uh, involves P-chips, but involves many of them. So here's these, uh, these black points, there are four data points. And um, instead of just doing the, uh, looking at these points on this blue axis, we create some more axes. We look at the data in this axis and this axis, so they're a rotated version of the data. The Q data 
shows like this, it's just starting big and going small. The V data has a maximum point through here. And what we do is uh, we do um, P chips on this and this as well. And from taking a linear combination of this, this smooth data and this smooth data, we can recover this axis here. It's simply the sine of 45 times Q plus the sine of 40, cos of 45 times V. And that gives us the red curve. And our final answer is the average of the blue and the red. So the blue is the P chip, the simple P chip on the original axes. The red is the P chip on these other axes. Um, and we average the two and get the uh, dashed line. So that's the basis of the method. And uh, this is the same picture I showed. There it is in, in cyan or light blue. It does rather better. And the blown up picture here is rather better. So we're rather proud of that. And we thought, right. Now notice here, I've got the vertical axis <laughs> data index. So each of these bottles is spaced apart in one unit in the vertical. And um, but then we, we then we try and with the real data. So the real data actually is the same temperature data, but it was actually these quite crazy pressure intervals. So big pressure difference here, and then smaller up here. And then yeah, the spline was still crazy. The, but our new method is also pretty crazy, going down to very much frozen water here. Uh, but the answer was to uh, actually. Um, stay with our uh, data index here, which was uniform spacing in the vertical, that gave us the blue line, and do one extra uh, P-chip, which is the pressure uh, as a function of the, the data index. So, uh, and that gave us the, um, this line here, which is the blue line that's very close here. So we, in summary, we, we, um, this method is that we first of all adopt P-chips and throw out splines. It's really useful to have the data index as the independent variable uh, rather than an, an ununiform pressure axis. We do our eight rotations, giving the need for 16 P-chips. We average the eight answers. And the one last thing we do is to put, um, put the answer back into pressure space as one more P-chip. That works really well. Uh, and in the ocean context, we do we add an extra bells and whistles to this because we actually do our rotations in the temperature salinity diagram rather than uh, pressure versus all. Uh, and um, so here we have splines, a different method, and zooming up, we're doing rather well with our red. The previous, uh, if we use the method, the cyan method before, it also does rather well. Um, so we think that's, uh, we're rather pleased with that. We think we're actually getting some results that we we don't really deserve or even un properly understand, but it's working out very well. And as I said, it leads to, uh, in the data, the, the ocean heat content data from the 60s and 70s, which is rather sparse in the vertical, every 200 meters typically the data points were, uh, we're finding that we, we're getting a, a quite different answers to uh, the ocean heat contact uh, content back in those uh, era. And that's ongoing work. The last topic I'd like to talk about is um, an accelerated version of Newton's method, which is a method to solve any old function of x equals zero. <clears throat> so this, in first year university, you learn about this method in Mathematics 101. It's the new, the uh, next iteration is the old iteration of the, of the answer plus the function divided by its derivative, more than minus. So you start here at this initial value of your variable x you want to find. Your black is your function, which you know. And you're trying to find the intercept here where this function equals zero. And you come down, this, you apply this formula once and you come down the slope, here is the derivative, you come down to this point. You go up here, evaluate the function and its derivative and you come down again, you keep on repeating this. And so we ask, ask ourselves the question, why, when we're here, why are we throwing away the data we already know? We already know the function and its derivative here, and we're evaluating it again here. Um, what's, what's precluding us getting an answer straight away is the curvature of this line. Let's estimate that curvature, that second derivative, and see what we can do. So back to Newton's method, 
this is the formula, this is how the errors evolve. So if you have the error at one iteration, you square it, uh, and that's how the error is at the next iteration, and the, the constant out the front is the proportional to the second derivative of the function. So the new method, which was published uh, 11 months ago, is, is you have the same kind of formula, but a little multiplying factor here, and the multiplying factor is a half plus the square root of this thing, now, if the second derivative is small, then this thing becomes a half plus the square root of a half, which is kind of, of quarter, which is a half, become very close to Newton's method. But, um, uh, and the maximum here is just stop this thing going crazy, uh, so you don't get uh, negative numbers uh, to limit how it behaves. Um, but importantly, this is how it behaves. If you have um, the, the present error estimate from the root is, is a certain value, uh, the next one will go like the power of root three plus one. So that's 2.7 as opposed to two up here. So that's our main advantage. The next advantage is that the constant at the front doesn't depend anymore on the second derivative or even the third, depends on the fourth derivative. So those things are very uh, uh, important features. And this is an uh, indication of how well we're doing in terms of that power. So we have two function a function evaluation and derivative, just like Newton, we have the same here, one of each. And you take the square, or you take the, if you have two here, you take the square root of your power that you're asymptoting towards. This is our, our rate of uh, approaching the root, uh, which is actually much, you know, quite a lot larger than Newton, but also larger than these other methods, including Sekant. Um, so I really like that uh, there. And in terms of the, some examples, there's nine different functions here with a whole lot of different initial conditions. So we've, the, the root is actually where the dark blue line is here. Our method is this one called Newton 2. Um, and compared to Newton, you can see we're getting there in a blue, a blue number of uh, iterations uh, versus a green number. So the average improvement is 10 iterations versus 16 iterations to get to machine precision of 10 to minus 16. And you can see not only does it get there faster, but it also converges better. So here, if you start this function off in this range, you don't converge, but here we do converge. So there's a lot to be said for it. And I believe um, there was a short, there was a small um, earth tremor in in London in 11 months ago when this paper was published and I believe it may have been Sir Isaac himself turning in his grave but uh, Westminster Abbey. Okay so um, that's the end of my talk. I hope I've uh, explained a little bit about how uh, the climate works and the fact that we are uh, beyond time in terms of doing, being serious about this problem and every decade that we've um, we've wasted uh, it means that we, it's very much harder to catch up um, and that we'll need to have, uh, need, we'll now need to have some negative carbon emissions uh, as uh, in the years beyond 2050 because of that. Um, I found that physical oceanography is a rather young science, certainly young compared to atmospheric science and it's still possible to do some quite fundamental things that are uh, theoretical but also uh, fundamental and fun to do um, and uh, what could be a more exciting career just in case Ian you wanted a new career <laughs> yes thank you Trevor thank you for, for, for a wonderful uh, exciting uh, talk covering a tremendous amount of ground uh, so if we're uh, we're perhaps running a little late, but still it's been so exciting. I think we do need we do have time for questions, and uh, there if you want to raise if you want to raise a question, please. Uh, well, some are coming in now on on chat. Uh, so 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 let me just just sort of make a comment myself for a moment as as people uh, gather themselves. It it seems to me that. Well, it is uh, absolutely extraordinarily important. First of all, you've told us that oceans are central in the climate change. And indeed, in a terrifying sort of way that, that the heat that's already in our oceans is, a, is already a cause for great uh, sadness, for sorrow, for, for trouble in the future. We learn about mixing, how important that is, how vertical mixing is important. 
I, I, I heard about thermocline, thermo, thermo, thermo haline circulation, uh, which I haven't yet understood, but, but uh, they're all very challenging. You know, we, I would say we, we computational mathematicians rather like things to be simpler than you were describing, but I know it's not your fault that the oceanography is, is, is physically, I mean, and, and it, on, on, uh, very complex and the different scales are very uh, important and uh, intriguing to work out. We, we've had some, uh, some uh, questions about, uh, well, about your comments about, uh, about um, well, well, first of all, I, I have one here that I've now lost. Uh, is there, is there, is, is there a, a document describing your interpolation method? I know, yes, there is, and you will uh, be happy to put it, uh, to make it available to us. Is there a recording that's been asked? I've been told by Joseph that yes, it, your, your, your proceedings will be online at, at some time. And... Uh, yes, I can say that the, uh, in the interpolation uh, work is published uh, last year, I think it is, or maybe earlier this year, and also uh, software is available to to implement it as well. Yeah. Could I make my own comment about the interpolation work? I can see that it, it is very well adapted to exactly what you are doing, but its generality must be a little questionable, I suppose, in the sense that it, you, you talk about rotating, you know, in, in, in simple terms, you you rotate, you have data in both the X and Y coordinates and you rotate. But that all depends on how you have uh, chosen your units. So clearly it depends on your choice of units and doing it well. If you change the scale on either the vertical or horizontal axis, but clearly rotation has a quite different meaning. Yes, so um, that's a really good point. And um, so in, 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 in our, our most accurate one for oceanography, as I said, we use temperature and salinity as the, as the axes and we rotate in that diagram. And um, the, the sensible way of picking the, the axis, the relative size of the axes is actually the, um, the range from minimum to maximum temperature in the ocean, minimum maximum salinity. And the reason for that we think is that the ocean is, is a bunch of fluid uh, that's forced at the sea surface uh, and perhaps by geothermal heating. But once you're in the interior of the ocean, the mixing processes, whether they be lateral or vertical, operate on temperature and salinity exactly the same way. So they're really just two traces that are being moved, uh, being maxed, uh, worked upon by mixing. And so um, that's why we think that's the most recent, the most sensible. Are they scaled the same way? That was that clear from your answer? I mean, you, you, you change your way of measuring salinity, is it? You know, yes, yeah, so, so um, imagine it was temperature and something else like nitrate or, or, or something, then you just go away and figure out what's the maximum and minimum ranges of that variable in the ocean. Okay, so you have scaled, you have scaled them appropriately. Though. Oh, yes. That's, the, that's first, the, answer, the answer to the question. Yes, but they actually, in the first method, the, the cyan color one uh, is just one temperature versus versus uh, another property which is not you know non-intensive property like pressure would be like pressure and that still works well and but uh, there we pick the scale how you measure pressure yeah, yeah. It, well it there we pick the scaling to be yeah. to be based on what's the maximum yeah. gradient of that function so okay. yeah anyway it's, I, it's don't, a, I don't want to pursue my uh, my, my, my question. I've been also asked by uh, Giovanni, excuse me, the, the, the writing is so small, I can't tell. Igori, is it? Did you test the method by undersampling observations? Does it always outperform linear interpolation? Yes, we have tested it by uh, having real data that we know at you know, every, um, every one meter and then undersampling uh, terribly. Uh, and checking against that, yeah. So Pavel Sakov asked, the second, second method is robust to small wiggles of the function. I guess that's a comment. Any comment, any comment on that? The second method is robust to small wiggles of the function. So I guess that's a, that's a comment about alternative method. The second method 
I guess also uses the two preceding data points. I've, I've forgotten what the SQL method does. Yeah, the second second method will, if it's wiggly, it'll it'll find a solution, uh, and you know all those methods. Uh, there's no guarantee what solution it will find if you've got lots of wiggles, but it'll find one. Yes. And uh, Jeff uh, Stanley says that the new Newton's method requires computing a square root. But isn't the fastest way to compute square roots an application of Newton's method? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yes, that's true. Even though, I mean, yeah. even though the new, but still, in all that's offline. The new method, uh, uh, even though the new method is faster in terms of the number of iterations, is it faster in terms of CPU time? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, where, where these things matter is where the function involves, you know, thousands of, of computations. And sure. then one more square root isn't just nothing. Sure. So, well, I, I hope I'm not, uh, I'm just trying to, for the questions have rolled in in the last few, few moments. Uh, but, uh, yes. Good application of Newton's method, says Mohammed. Said, uh, very informative and excellent talk. Actually, that's a very good point at which to, to finish the discussion. Uh, Trevor, I, th I know that we're all extremely grateful to you for taking us on this fascinating journey. It's one that is of enormous importance, of course, practical importance, also of great difficulty, great difficulty. I, I must say we don't like as much complexity as you have told us about, but that's the way the that's, that's as it is, as I think the great man said. <laughs> and uh, so uh, if there are no more questions, all of a sudden, thanks for a good talk, Trevor. Can you please some you. other applications of the, the TRM velocities besides calculating the transport? Is that a, that's a question for you from Aaron? Yes, you Can you please introduce some other applications of the TRM velocities? Yeah, so the TRM is is uh, is used uh, in in ocean models going forward, and uh, it's uh, in the Southern Ocean in particular, where where the uh, because there's no continents uh, interrupting a circular route around the Southern Ocean, there's actually no mean flow in the upper uh, couple of thousand meters. Uh, when you can, when no mean flow in terms of the zonally average flow, and so the only way you get a mean flow is by this extra quasi-Stokes uh, velocity and um, yeah so it's it's been a very valuable uh, big improvement to ocean models in the last 25 years. So also I see thank you young Trevor thank you Trevor thank you Trevor awesome info and very engaging so I, I couldn't do better with a vote of thanks and to, to sum up my my uh, the, the participants of whom there have been more than 70 tonight and uh, no doubt more when it, we have the recorded version. Thank you so much for giving us so much to think about, Trevor. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I, I do regret, I did promise someone I'd give the whole talk standing in my head and I haven't done that. So uh, maybe <laughs> next time. <laughs> Edward uh, Dodderud had as a question. Did, did, did you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? No, that wasn't a question. That was a little clap emoji. Oh, it's a clap. Okay, the clap. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, you can all unmute yourself and let's give him a round of uh, applause. Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you. Man. Good night. Good night to everyone. Thank you for cheers. participating. Thanks a lot. All right. Cheers.